Happy Friday, everybody. My name is Lillian Ansley, and I am very excited to welcome you today. And thank you for joining us live on Facebook. Please know that a recording of this hot topic will be on our Facebook page and it'll also be available on YouTube. When plastic surgery opened its doors 20 years ago on October the 2nd, 2020, we launched with a hot topic lecture series. The intimate presentations that have traditionally take place in our offices with our surgeons and staff have always been meant to share the latest techniques and technologies. In this unprecedented time, we are so excited to present our first virtual hot topic. Today's hot topic is facial rejuvenation. We've got our surgeons and Kristen Costa, who is a faculty member at Allergan Medical Institute and is a trainer. They're going to share with you the latest techniques and technologies to, in non-surgical as well as surgical so that you can make informed decisions about any of your facial rejuvenation goals. I just got slipped a note that Dr. Rosenberg is in surgery. We hope he'll be able to join us, but he may not. But Dr. Kerbo has him covered. So let's just get started with our founding partner, Dr. Ben Kerbo. For those of you who do not know Dr. Kerbo, he's a board certified plastic surgeon and he is based the practice is based in Tallahassee, Florida. We serve the entire North Florida, South Georgia, Southeastern United States, and we're very proud of the unique practice that's been built here where three board certified plastic surgeons have been curated to bring, bring unique skills that this region did not have. Dr. Kerbo, let's get started today and share with us a little bit about facial rejuvenation and our practice philosophy on this. Well, first of all, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. This is going to be sort of fun, so we're, we're going to have a good time and make it pretty informal. But facial rejuvenation is a, is a large part of our practice here, of our aesthetics out of our practice. And so, uh, a lot of people are asking us, you know, what can we do at a younger age as we prepare uh, ourselves uh, for some of the changes as we age? And whether you're uh, 15, 16, 20 years old, or you're 50, 60, 70 years old, we believe at this practice that several things are basic in facial rejuvenation and helping keep that healthy look and glow to your face. You probably all know them. It's good hydration at a young age good water intake, good hydration on the surface. We all know about the sun. The sun is our, our enemy when it comes to facial rejuvenation. So making sure our sun exposure is minimum, using the newer sunblocks and sun, sunscreens that are available today are very important to, uh, to decreasing the damage that the sun and the environment can do over time. And then today, there are very, uh, uh, very good products that help uh, rejuvenate our skin non-surgically, such as many of the antioxidants, uh, the Retin-A's. And these things are all available to people today, much so than they've ever been. And they're available in dosing that uh, can really help people. I always think it's a good idea, too, at some point in time, to consult a a skin specialist. Uh, many of the estheticians uh, are very skilled in evaluating skin and putting people on a long-term plan for their skin care and helping them maintain a youthful appearance to their skin. Does anyone have any questions for um, Dr. Kerbo or Kristen? as we go through this, that's how this is gonna be. 
we, we want to be this an engaging conversation as if you were in our practice right now, sitting in front of everyone. So please feel free to share questions um, after each presentation. And I'm real excited for Adrienne Griffith is going to be our moderator for our questions. And if you're a current patient, you probably know Adrienne. Hey, Adrienne. So, Hi. so let's go now to Kristen Costa. Many of them of you also know Kristen. Kristen, as we mentioned, is a national trainer for Botox and derma fillers. And you can discuss the tip. Kristen, can you discuss in layman's term the difference between neurotoxins and derma, dermal fillers for our audience? Sure. Absolutely. I'd love to. Hi, everybody. Happy Friday. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk to you today just a little bit because I could talk to you for hours because I love talking about them, but about the difference between the neuromodulators and the dermal fillers. Um, we do have a couple slides um, that we're going to bring up in just a little bit, too. So to differentiate, the neuromodulators are the ones that are going to temporarily relax the muscles anywhere from three to six months. So this is what's going to smooth and keep soft the mo lines of motion. The fillers are going to do more lines at rest or depressions or um, kind of convexity and concavities on our face. But the neuromodulators, the most popular ones in the United States today are the Botox, the Dysport, the Xeomin, and the newest one out on the market is Juveau. Um, they all basically do the same thing. Um, the companies will, of course, tell you that they don't. Um, but basically, they do the same thing um, by relaxing those muscles just a little bit. Um, a lot of people worry that things are getting paralyzed, but it's more just temporary, temporarily relaxing those muscles. Um, always, I tell people there's a slight chance you could have some bruising, um, slight chance you could um, have some flu-like effect. Um, I've only had one person ever complain of that in all the years that I've been here. Um, and afterwards it's the neuromodulator procedure is super fast. That's the one where you come in and out. People do it on a lunch break. They do it before or after work. Um, and that one is quick and easy for the most part. Then if we're going to differentiate and talk about some of the fillers, um, those can take just a little bit longer. The procedure takes anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour on an average. Um, and these are things that are going to fill those areas on your face. The most common areas are going to be, you know, the folds here, the corners of the mouth down, the lips, the cheeks, um, really kind of shaping the face doing all different types of ways. We can do ones that are going to last as short as six months or all the way up to two years. They um, act differently. So there's some hyaluronic acids, there's calcium hydroxyapatate, which is all kind of confusing words that you don't necessarily need to know. That's for me to know um, and help you meet your goals based off of what you'd like to talk about. Um, the neuromodulators I meant to mention before, most commonly those are done in the forehead lines, the frown lines between the eye, and then the crow's feet on the side. Um, those are the three most common areas that we do, but it actually can be used in other areas as well. Um, and I'm going to now show you some different um, slides, some before and afters on them. So here is um, one of the neuromodulators. So you can see the top is the before and the one on your left hand side is at rest. And then the one on the right hand side is in motion. And so you can see even afterwards, sometimes it will soften those lines at rest, but mainly it's meant to soften those lines in motion. You can see she's trying to frown as hard as possible and just can't on that bottom right. Next slide, please. And here's a similar example. Um, another one between the brows. You can see on that bottom right, she's trying as hard as she can and just can't. It's always fun when I tell somebody, okay, frown for me. And then I'm like, okay, you can't. <laughs> and here's the forehead. Um, both men and women do this. So sometimes people are surprised to see men in the pictures, but with men and women, it's very common for both to do. And you can see he can still get his eyes bright and open, um, but doesn't have those accordion lines on the forehead as much as he did before. And so here's some of the fillers. Um, this is a perfect example. The most common areas that we do are gonna be these folds and the lips. 
And here's some of the folds on the befores are on the left hand side and the afters are on the right hand side. And you can see everyone just looks a little softer. I really like to talk about filler more as um, kind of airbrushing rather than correction and complete correction. You don't want to have no lines on your face. It would look odd or weird. Um, but to just kind of soften things and make you look more airbrushed. Next slide, please. Here's an example of a very subtle lip. Um, not everyone has to come out looking all full. You know, the most common thing I hear right now is I want Kim Kardashian lips or I don't want Kim Kardashian lips. Um, used to be um, Lisa Rene or um, Angelina Jolie. Those were before, but now we've moved on to some different lip names. Um, but here's a perfect example, a very subtle, very soft and natural. It just helped to take out some of the fine lines in her lips and give her just a tiny bit of volume. Next slide, please. Here's someone who wanted a softening when she did smile. Um, we now also have some flexible fillers that are really dynamic and can help soften these lines just a little bit when you do smile. Um, but you can also see at rest on the right hand side that she's much smoother as well. And there's less of that kind of shadowing as the light hits. And here's some lips. Um, lips are definitely, I would say, on the rise of popularity. Um, they kind of have waxed and waned over the years of what, um, how often we do them. But I would say that's probably one of the commonplace things we're doing right now. Um, and you can see not only did kind of the corners of her mouth turn up, but she also got some nice volume on the top and the bottom. And here's a little bit more subtle, but you can also see kind of from the side, it shrunk the distance between her nose to her top lip but then also gave her a little projection on the bottom of her lip too. So that's the nice thing too, is we have a lot of different kinds of fillers that can, based off of what your desires and what your needs are. So we can really help to streamline exactly what it is that you would like for correction. I have a question. Would you ever use a person's fat instead of a filler? So you definitely can. And that's something that's um, many times if we've tried some different fillers and we're liking what it's looking like, but we just think we need a little more volume, the fat can be semi-permanent. So it's nice to be able to do. That's not going to be a lunchtime procedure. It's not going to be something that you do as quick and easy, but it is definitely something that the surgeons can do. Um, so after seeing me, then sometimes I shift them to the doctors. So I have another question here. How long can we expect the results to last with fillers? That's a great question. And depending on the type of filler that we use, the hyaluronic acids are typically going to, um, which is the most popular. We don't really use collagen anymore because those really ultimately only lasted like two to four months. So mm -hmm. hyaluronic acid is the most popular type of filler product on the market. And those typically last six months to a year. There are a couple that can last you up to 18 months. And then some of the ones that are gonna go more in the cheek area to give more volume or sculpting the whole face, those can last up to two years. Excellent, thank you. Well, injectables seem to be a great option for helping to smooth these fine lines and prevent deeper wrinkles. Are there other options out there for people who would like to resurface the texture and tighten the skin, but are not really ready for a facelift? Yes, there are. And we have everything from light peels and photo facials all the way up to the deeper chemical peels. Um, and they, we have physician grade chemical peels. And I think the doctors are gonna touch on those in a little bit. Yes, Dr. Kerbo, does the phenol pill take the place of a facelift? Uh, well, no, it doesn't. Uh, it addresses a different part uh, of facial rejuvenation. You know, when you first asked me the questions, we talked about some of the things that we can do to prepare ourselves, but Kristen did a great job piggyback into those healthy habits we can have to help improve our skin. But as we begin to age and get these fine lines and creases, that's where an incredible change in our business has, has happened with all the injectables and the fillers that can help those people with early signs of aging. When you talk about phenol peel, 
or peeled, you get back to dealing with the environmental damage to the skin that may be related to the sun or other environmental problems. And so uh, it can help a part of the aging face, but it's certainly not going to address some of the issues that the fillers will address and certainly won't address some of the issues that more aggressive surgical facelifting uh, will address. Then oftentimes rejuvenating the face is a combination of all those things. And, uh, and we do a little bit of those uh, um, uh, all together to get the final result someone wants from their facial rejuvenation. Dr. Rosenberg, would you like to chime in? We're so glad to see you. Thanks for being able to join us. Sorry, sorry, I was running late. No, I completely agree. I think, you know, I look at it as two different issues. You know, you have the underlying structures uh, that are really addressed uh, in a facelift, and then you redrape the skin. But the critical component of the facelift is ensuring that you build the foundation. And then uh, peels really help a lot with kind of the texture and the appearance of the skin, kind of like the surface. Uh, and I think they work extremely well in complement to each other, but not really in replacement. And that was a question. Um, actually, we got the question several times. Does it replace a facelift? So thanks for really punctuating that clarification. You're welcome. Um, is there anything else you would like to add about the phenol pill, Dr. Rosenberg? Uh, no, I mean, it's a, it's a peel. It's a, you know, it's a recovery. You do a preparation usually for about six weeks and it's an important prep to get your skin ready for it. Uh, on the day of the peel, it's done under a light sedation uh, and you, you go home. You're usually completely rehealed by two weeks. However, you can have redness and that redness can go on for some time. It's readily covered by makeup, but it's red nonetheless and patients need to be prepared. Uh, I think most patients are pretty surprised with the changes that you can get with a phenol peel uh, in terms of improvement to skin, texture, tone, uh, and then the lines, of course, which is what bothers most patients. Do we have any before and after photographs of anyone? I, I know people wonder, you know, does it really do what you're saying it's gonna do? Sure, we definitely do. Uh, I always show patients my own my own before and afters. So I have a series of patients uh, that I show them of my own patients. And then I try to match, you know, what they look like to the patient that I think uh, matches them best because we see different variations and not all people who need a phenol peel have the exact same problem. Uh, if we can go to the next slide on this, you know, this is a lady who's actually only 48 years old and the side picture is actually even more remarkable, but she has incredibly deep, thick, heavy lines. And afterwards, you know, you can see the cheeks are almost free of lines. Now the chin still has some, and I always tell patients, you have to be very careful peeling the chin. And often you have to do two peels on someone like this on the chin to get it where you want it. And she was so happy after one that she didn't want to do it. Uh, but you can make a remarkable a remarkable difference on these patients for sure. Uh, the next slide, I don't know, uh, shows her from the side and you can just see, you know, the significant improvements to her cheeks. But you can also see where I think on the chin, uh, a second peel would really finish it off and make it really look quite nice. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a lady who would benefit uh, probably from a facelift as well, but some women come in and, and men and they're like, we are not interested or I'm not interested in a phenol peel, I mean a facelift. And so this is a phenol peel. That's all she had. But you can see before she had significant sun damage and lines on the side of her eyes, cheeks, around her lips. But it also looks like what you can see as though she lost weight. She didn't lose weight and she didn't have a facelift, but it is very uh, noticeable that her face looks much thinner. And I don't tell patients that this always happens with a aggressive phenol peel, but it absolutely can make a substantial change 
you know, into the form of the face. Next slide, please. And then here you can see her from the side where you can see a lot of that, if not all of the sun damage is gone and then the fine lines that she had. Uh, you do notice also down near the neck though, you have to be very careful like the chin and you cannot over peel the neck. Uh, and sometimes a series of peels needs to be done on the neck to get the same kind of difference or improvement in result. Uh, here's another lady who had uh, acne scarring and a lot of lines. They're best seen in the next slide. Uh, and she, again, was another patient who did not want a phenol peel. She didn't care about the jowl. She just wanted improvement in her uh, tone, texture, and then uh, the deep lines that she has. And when you look at the next slide, the before and after, you can just see uh, how much you know more smooth her skin appears. Those deep lines just outside the corner of the mouth are gone. Uh, and just what an overall improvement uh, she had. Wow. Tremendous difference. Tremendous. Thank you. I think we have a few questions that have come across um, Facebook. Adrian. Yes, uh, I have a question here from Leslie and she wants to know what is the difference in downtime between a deep chemical peel like your phenol peel and a facelift? Uh, excellent question. It's a similar downtime, uh, maybe a little bit less with a phenol peel, but that's only if you will accept going out with redness. You know, it is a little bit easier to cover the redness up. I always suggest women use mineral makeup. It just covers it very nicely. But the recovery from a phenol peel, you know, is going to be about two weeks, very similar to a facelift. Would you ever um, do them in conjunction or at the same time? You know, so that's controversial. I do not. There are some surgeons who do, but I'm very cautious. And from for safety reasons, because of the depth of the peel, you do run the risk of wound healing and what we call skin necrosis. And so most surgeons will not do a deep phenol peel at the same time as a facelift, just because of the potential risk of complications. A lot of people would like it for sure. For me, uh, it's not worth the risk. Safety part. Yeah, and I, I completely agree uh, with, with uh, Dr. Rosenberg. Uh, we're stressing the skin. Uh, when we do a facelift and we're stressing the skin when we do a phenol peel, in sort of two different uh, ways. And uh, um, <clears throat> the risk of having a problem is just too high. And it, I think uh, I would be very uh, cautious of someone who, who suggests those are done at the same time. So Dr. Kerbo, what do you look for to determine if someone needs a facelift? Well, a lot of what we've already been talking about is is sort of on the surface, like Dr. Rosenberg's said, but as unfortunately we all know, as we age, just the environmental or surface damage uh, is only one aspect of, of aging. And so we begin to look at more of the things that a facelift can address. And um, the fillers can, can, can be a little bridge, but as we age, if you look at this slide, um, you can see what happens over time other than environmental damage. This is a nice illustration and, and animation of a, a, a young woman as she progresses through age. And you can see what I would call gravitational descent of the deeper structures, not the skin. The skin is pulled and follows those deeper structures. Those deeper structures is a system called the SMAS system. And as we age, that system support begins to, to relax. And so as it moves downward, it pulls the skin with it. That results in what we call jowling. It results in a squaring of the face, and then it can result in banding or what appears to be loose skin in the, in the neck region. And so I'm looking at the degree of those types of changes and asking the patients, 
what they want. Is that what they want improved? And again, fillers can help a little bit, but that um, once it gets to a certain point, if we want to improve that, we've got to do some type of surgical rejuvenation or tightening. Now, along with those gravitational stent, uh, descent, we almost look at volume loss. It's very clear now through studies that after about the age of 35, uh, we begin to lose a certain amount of soft tissue volume in our face. And with women, we also see a lot of bone density or volume loss. And so many times the combination of that volume loss and that gravitational scent will help start producing uh, the, the, the areas and the changes that can be reversed with a facelift. Uh, and the three main areas where we really see facelift improving is some of the deep facial wrinkles in the, in the nasolabial folds, we, in the jowling area, and really the jawline in the neck is, is, um, is an incredible area that we see the facelift improve. So if you look at this patient, you can see uh, she is a pretty uh, typical of some of the patients we see. You notice sort of the squaring of her face and the jowling. Those are the deep structures that are pulling the skin with it. You can look in the neck area. That's the, the platysma, muscle, platysma muscle, which is part of the SMAS that is descending and pulling down. Now, there may be some fatty and tissue in there that we have to deal with, but the majority of those changes are related to her gravitational descent. You might, may not think she's lost volume in her face, but if you begin to look under her eyes where you begin to see what we call those sort of lines or tear troughing, that's loss of volume in that area combined with that gravitational descent. So in my opinion, she has some significant signs of gravitational descent, some significant signs of volume loss, and a facelift is what will be required if she wants to sharpen her jawline and her neck and her cheek area. This is another patient completely opposite, but the same thing is going on. You can really see the banding in her neck. That's not loose skin there. That's the platysma muscle that is descending and carrying that skin with it. You can see her face has squared up some in the deeper folds in the nasolabial crease. And again, you can see the loss of volume in her. If you look in her temporal area, which is the area just in front of the hairline, you can see she's lost some volume and she's lost some volume in her cheek area. Now, people don't look at us and go, boy, they've got temporal volume loss, but the whole picture gives a sign of aging. And so with this patient, if she wants a sharp jawline and wants to increase the youth of her face, then I think a facelift with some type of volume uh, replacement uh, is required. So, this is nice because this is the patient that we showed you uh, in the first photo. And you can see what's happened with her with just a facelift uh, and some fat transfer volume. And I think we did do her upper eyelids. Look at the change in the shape of her face. The jowling is significantly improved. She's gone from a square face to more of a round face. If you look from the side view on the next slide, you can really get an idea of the change in her neck and jawline. That can't be achieved with a deep phenol peel or fillers, but it can be achieved surgically. Uh, and this is a patient who also has a significant amount of environmental damage that we talk about. And she's a patient that we may in another sitting want to proceed with a phenol peel or get her into some good skin care systems to help decrease some of that aging environmental damage. Next slide. So again, this is the patient we showed you before with completely different body and facial shape, but you can see from a facelift what it's done. It's gotten completely rid of the banding that you see in her neck. She's got more of a sharper jawline from the front. And again, some of that volume replacement in her cheeks and in her temporal area just gives her a little more youthful look to her face. If you look from the side view, you'll see that, um, that you can see a significant change in her jawline 
and the projection of our cheek area, that is from the fat uh, uh, um, transfer and repositioning those deeper structures back to their normal position. And what I like to point out about these patients is we want these patients not to look like they've had surgery. We just want to turn back the clock. We want you to look better, not different. And so many times we'll have folks bring in photographs of them 10 or 15 years ago. So we know where their volume was back then or where the positioning of their deeper structures were. Uh, this is just another patient that we see here. Again, she has gone sort of from a square uh, a face to more of a rounder face and uh, just a little more volume in her face that makes her look uh, more youthful. If you look from the side view, you can uh, really appreciate her jawline and the changes in her neck, which is what a lot of people who come in for vational rejuvenation are really, really looking for. If you can pull that next slide up. So you can see there a very natural jawline, very natural change, and it just turns back the clock on her and you can appreciate a little more projection in her uh, cheek area and, um, and just a sharper jawline. And this is, uh, I think, the last patient we're going to show you. Again, this patient uh, complaining typically of sort of the squaring of her face. This patient actually complained a lot uh, and wanted to see if we could improve the look of the area around her eyes. Um, and so we not only performed a facelift, uh, we went ahead with some eyelid surgery that was done at the same time. This patient also had a phenol peel performed at a second stage. So if you look at the, the next pictures, you can see a nice natural change in her. Again, the neck and jawline to me looks more natural. The eyelids, you can see the distance between her cheek and her lower eyelid looks uh, improved. Um, and her overall skin texture, tone, pore size, environmental damage is improved. But it, to, to me, it looks very natural um, but a significant improvement. So just so that I understand and all of our viewers understand, once you have a facelift, do you still need to get Botox and fillers? Well, as we talked about before, those are almost two separate issues. So if a patient was getting fillers for some deeper lines and wrinkles, no. But if a patient was getting fillers, I mean, in Botox for some fine crow's feet around her eyes or some of her frown lines or the forehead, yes, they would need to continue to get Botox because those lines and wrinkles are caused by the movement of those muscles. The Botox or fillers, it's not going to improve significantly the banding in the neck or the appearance of the jawline. So, Many people who do get facelifts or surgically uh, or phenol pills will continue to do some type of uh, non-surgical treatment to help maintain some of those changes that the surgical uh, intervention won't, won't, wouldn't really affect in the first place. Now, sometimes if they need more volume, you can use those fillers to add volume to help enhance a facelift if fat transfer is not an option. So we have another question here from Melissa and she's wanting to know what are your thoughts on fillers for the tear troughs? And we, just as a follow-up, we have a lot of questions coming in and we will be answering those at the end of the panel discussion. Dr. Well, Kerbo? I can let uh, Dr. Rosenberg or, or um, um, Kristen chime in, but the teardrop is a very, uh, okay. it's a very tedious area with very, very thin skin around the eyes. And so there is some use of filler in this area, but you really have to have someone who has experience doing that. And I'm going to turn it over to Kristen to let her give her opinion because she is someone who has a lot of experience in these areas. I would say officially there is no FDA filler on the market that's approved for that area. 
That's not to say that there aren't some people that are candidates and that we can do that in that area, but not everyone is a candidate. Just because your under eye area bothers you doesn't necessarily mean that the filler is going to correct that. Um, for someone who has true tear trough depressions, then it can give some volume in that area and make you look a little more rejuvenated and fresher under your eyes. But we have to be careful because if you have um, some fat herniation or some puffiness under your eyes, for us to bring that tear trough level out that far will actually make you look more tired um, by making you look like you have more severe bags under your eyes. So you have to be just the right candidate, but we do have patients that are good candidates for it. And if not, I usually grab one of the doctors to come in and talk. And that's the nice part about having a seamless practice like ours, because we can do everything from least invasive to most invasive. Good. Dr. Rosenberg, I have another follow-up question here for you. If a patient is determined that they want to do structurally a facelift, but they also want to improve their skin texture, uh, with the phenol peel, is there a preference for an order of treatment? No, generally not. Really, I just ask them what bothers them the most. And I also look at them and, and see what they need done. Because some people are on the border of needing both. Some people need one a lot more than the other. And so for me, that's what I use to guide my decision as to which to do first, but I do them both ways, as does Dr. Kerbo. It's really just how it fits into the patient's schedule and really kind of what they need and what bothers them more. Because generally people have something that is addressed by one or the other that bothers them more than what is addressed by the secondary procedure. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, it sounds like Many times patients also want to address the appearance of their eyes um, with or without a facelift. So what are the options out there, Dr. Rosenberg, with rejuvenating the eye area? Uh, that's a great question. So there are, you know, it's a whole spectrum as Kristen uh, talked about just a few minutes ago, and that is that some people need very little done. Some people need Botox for crow's feet or they need filler uh, to help the tear trough of that would benefit. But as aging progresses, they often need more done. And usually that's in the form of what we call blepharoplasty or eyelid surgery. Generally, we categorize that as the upper eyelids and the lower eyelids, and they're separate. Uh, both can be done at the same time, and both have different issues. Generally, with the upper eyelids, there's excessive skin that hangs down that needs to be removed. And then on the lower eyelids, it's a combination of wrinkling of the skin, but also excessive fat that makes their eyes look puffy, or as Kristen said, often makes people look tired. Uh, there's a whole spectrum as to how we treat it. Some patients, you only remove skin. Some patients, you remove skin and you remove some fat. And then many patients, depending on what they need, it's only fat that you're removing to make them look, uh, look better. Uh, could you go to the next slide? So here's a lady before and after, and she underwent an upper lid blepharoplasty or upper eyelid surgery. And you can see uh, beforehand, she had a lot of lateral skin, it made her eyes look tired. You can almost see her eyelids resting on her eyelashes. Afterwards, her eyes look more open, but really it's that the skin was taken away and only a small amount of fat on her most people think that they have a lot of extra fat and that's what's creating part of this in addition to the skin. But we have learned uh, over the years that really we don't take out a lot of fat in the upper eyelids, but really we redistribute it so that it's more evenly balanced and makes the eye blend well. Next slide. Here is her from the side and you especially can see out laterally where when that extra skin is taken away, you really see the natural eyelid crease uh, and it really makes her look far younger uh, than before the surgery. Next slide. Uh, here's a lady who underwent lower eyelid surgery uh, and you can see beforehand, she has those uh, extra fat pads underneath her eyes. Her skin though is much more smooth 
And really this is a dream patient for a lower lip blepharoplasty uh, because this is really readily surgically correctable. You do take out some skin when you do this procedure, but the primary uh, way to make her look like she does afterwards is to take out some of that fat that you can see puffing out and then redistribute some of the fat to help smooth out the tear trough and then make that transition between the eyelid and the cheek more smooth so that there's not ridges or folds that define the separation between the eyelid and the cheek. Uh, that's frequently talked about uh, in aesthetic surgery that a youthful cheek eyelid junction is smooth. You don't have a deep transition or a deep line that creates and separates the two uh, parts of the face. Next slide. And here you can see her afterwards. And this better shows you that fat that's pooching out on that left slide. And then you can see afterwards just how nice and smooth the eyelid looks and how it's just a very nice transition between that lower eyelid and that cheek. Next slide, please. Here's another lady uh, before and after. And again, it's she had upper eyelid surgery. And beforehand on the left, you really can't see the crease that separates uh, the two portions of the eyelid. But afterwards, it just she looks more awake, she looks less tired, and she looks uh, rejuvenated. Next slide, please. And then here she is from the side. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um. Dr. Rosenberg, talk to me a little bit about insurance. We've had some insurance questions. Will insurance pay for some of these procedures? They will. Sometimes, sometimes insurance will pay for your upper eyelids to be done. Uh, it depends on how much of your field of vision is being obstructed from your eyelids. And they ha we uh, have tests that determine that. And then between that and looking at your photographs and doing measurements, of how close your eyelid is to your pupil, that's the black circle in the middle of your eye, helps determine whether your insurance would cover it and what exact surgery you need. Because some people have too much skin, it weighs down the eyelids, and that is the problem. But as we age, sometimes your eyelid, the muscle stretches and it doesn't open your eye as much. And that mm -hmm. eyelid muscle called the levator needs to be tightened to help it so that your eye opens properly. Thank you. So now we have some more questions popping up here. Uh, this one is from Jessica and she's asking, what are the differences, Dr. Rosenberg, in fat injection uh, versus using filler in the face for longevity and the result? I know Kristen did touch on some of that, but um, talk about longevity with those two different uh, approaches. Yeah, so generally the fillers are not permanent. And there, there is a whole spectrum of fillers on the market and some of them last longer than others. Fat injections can last forever. Uh, we've come a long way in the way we process it to improve survival because at first that was a significant issue when you did fat injections that you would lose some of the fat grafting. Uh, that has come a long way under some of the pioneering work of Dr. Coleman and so generally we have much better survival of the fat grafting and therefore patients can expect it to last a long time, if not indefinitely. I generally tell patients that if they're unsure of what they want, especially in areas where it can be tricky or where looks sometimes change or desired looks change, to do the fillers and do them first. And then if they're very happy with that, then do the fat grafting because once you do fat grafting it can be permanent and that's both good and bad and if you're not happy with how it turns out it can be a little bit more tricky to reverse that i see thank you dr kerbo do you have any other comments about that i, I completely agree with him is that uh you know that's exactly what i tell the patients uh that are asking me those questions the the good news about a filler is it's predictable generally, um, and and they work. The bad news is they is they go away, uh, but then there's good news if you don't like it, it goes away. So I agree with that approach to to sort of try to the fillers 
and see and see what you think. I mean, there's some areas that are hard to get the result we may get with fat transfer uh, with filler and the volume of filler. Uh, but uh, but I think in general, that's a good approach. Um, I just got handed another question related to the um, upper and lower bluffs. Um, talk about doing them under sedation or under local. Go ahead, Lawrence. Oh, sure. So in general, the upper eyelid surgery uh, can be done under local where your patient comes in and it's done in the office uh, exam room, similar to the uh, doing a ex small excision. Uh, and some people want to be put all the way to sleep. And so really for me, that's patient preference, you know, what they want and what they f feel most comfortable with. In general, on the lower eyelids, those patients are almost always sedated or put to sleep. It's a little bit more difficult to do that under local and patients tend not to tolerate it as well. Thank you. So we're gonna bring everybody back. All the, they're all available to answer your questions directly or to chime in and um, give a more broad or depth um, aspect. So jump right in with your questions. Well, I have one here um, from Melissa, and she's asking uh, for Dr. Rosenberg and Dr. Kerbo, is there an average age that someone comes in for a facelift? And is it only women that do this? Well, I'll, I'll start off Dr. with this. Kerbo, Dr. Rosenberg? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I can, uh, I'll give a, my answer and Lawrence can, can give his, but you know, obviously there's would be a minimal age, but in general, uh, at least in our practice, I believe I've found the age of folks uh, wishing to undergo facelift and facial rejuvenation has gone down some, and it's not unusual for us to see these patients in their in their mid forties and even sometimes a little a little younger. The thought process is is that there's not a need for a drastic change. Uh, so uh, they don't have a drastic problem. So that change will be less drastic in appearance and uh, the recovery is better. The patient is healthy and you will get, I think, more longevity of that result. So uh, the, the answer is, of course, there would be a minimum age. You have to have some changes that we feel would be improved with a facelift, but it doesn't have to be drastic uh, uh, problems. And so I found many of the younger patients enjoy that because it's a little bit more permanent, if you will, other than the fillers, and it really addresses the whole face uh, in, in, in total. What do you think, Lawrence? No, I completely agree. And the only thing I would add is that, you know, not all facelifts are the same in that a younger patient may need what's called a short scar facelift. And so uh, modifications of the procedure can be performed to really address the fact, and often it is that the younger patients don't need as drastic or as much of a facelift in terms of length of incisions or what have you. Uh, Dr. Rosenberg, as a follow-up, Andra has a question here, and she's wanting to know um, how much downtime does she need to plan for if she's going to move forward with a facelift? Yeah, so I usually tell patients two weeks of downtime. That doesn't mean that they are not going to have a little bit of bruising or some swelling, uh, but in general, the patient has their stitches out at one week, and by two weeks, the vast majority of bruising and swelling is, is gone. Uh, having said that, there's always exceptions, but most patients follow, for me, that general rule. Thank you. And, and I, thank you. And I would like to go back to um, one part of a question that wasn't answered, and that was women versus men. Um, are you seeing more men getting facelifts, what ages, et cetera? Well, I'll, I'll say for me, uh, yes, we are seeing more men, um, but what I found in my practice is less younger men. I think uh, less so younger men. Uh, many of the men I see are men who are 
who are older, maybe 60s, 70s, that really have an issue most of the time with their neck and their jawline. And there's a certain operation that we perform that is really not a face lift. It's more of a surgical neck lift. And you can look at a lot of photos of that on our on our gallery. But these are men who come in and say, look, I don't want a facelift. I don't want the downtime, but I want this my saggy neck to go away. And so, yes, I think we're seeing more men for questions concerning facial rejuvenation and changes. And we're taking care of more men. But I wouldn't say necessarily we're doing more true facelifts uh, on men. And I don't know what Lawrence has experienced uh, uh, with himself. Yeah, the exact same. Absolutely. So I have another question that's popped up here from Shauna. And she wants to know if she were to get a facelift, how long she could expect those results to last? Either that's, of you gentlemen. That's a good question. I generally tell patients, you know, it's reasonable to expect the results to last 10 years. Uh, you know, some patients may have one and it lasts longer and some depending, you know, may last a little bit shorter. Some of it depends on where they start. You know, the two examples that Dr. Kerbo gave of those patients, that first patient, the patient uh, who had kind of the heavier neck, I think her results will last much longer than say the lady who's very thin with those bands. But I generally tell patients, you know, 10 years is a reasonable expectation. I think Thank uh, you. I, I may be a, a little bit more optimistic, but I think 10 years is a good time for um, at least in our community, we don't see a lot of patients coming at, back in for secondary facelifts. But I generally tell people if they're going to be inclined to want another facelift, I would expect probably in between 10 and 12, 13 years. Many times, though, I will tell them, uh, and, I, and I think Lawrence would agree, in 10 years, they will not be where they were for the facelift. And so someone who comes in is a little younger and you tell them in 10 years, you won't be where you are now uh, before you undergo that, that's very appealing to them because, um, you know, they don't, they don't have that drastic of a problem to begin with. And, and I agree with Lawrence on assessing those two patients, but that first patient with a heavy neck, she will never have that heavy neck again, unless I guess something drastic changed in her lifestyle. But, but some of those changes I think are a little bit more permanent, not permanent, but have a little more longevity than other changes. I have one last question here and then I'll let uh, Lily wrap things up. Uh, and that is if a patient is considering coming in, they're not sure what they want to do, but they have an event like a, a wedding or a reunion. Um, what sort of timeline, when do they need to start thinking of that before they make those plans? Dr. Rosenberg. Sure. So I, it depends on the procedure. Uh, but in general, I say three months beforehand makes the most sense uh, simply because one, you know, just in case something happens or that the healing isn't just perfect, you know, you don't want that event to be spoiled, especially if it's like a child's wedding, which is a frequent comment that we, of events that we hear. So I generally tell them three months, but it also depends. An upper lid eyelid surgery is going to be a much quicker recovery than say a phenol peel or a facelift. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I think what we're going to do now is um, refer everyone to continue to send in your questions in and also check out our face. I mean, our website, we have lots of um, before and after galleries on the website. Um, a whole section on facial rejuvenation and all the things that are covered. Um, we will continue to answer questions. If you want to send them through the website, secured and confidential, we'll be happy to have those questions answered. And if they're appropriate for open questions, we will continue to um, answer those on our Facebook. Um, a couple reminders. Um, we do have our 20th anniversary that uh, the benchmark is October the 2nd, 2020. 
that is our 20 years. And so we are excited that even this month, we are offering 20% off on any spa procedures. Again, in this unprecedented time, our open house for the holidays is not going to be like it's been in the past, but we've got some wonderful, exciting, and fun things planned for everyone, and it will include the 20% vouchers and the 20% um, skincare products in celebration of our 20th year anniversary of extraordinary expertise at this practice. Um, I would like to encourage everyone to share this video um, from Facebook and on YouTube with anyone you think that would benefit from the knowledge that has been shared. And I would encourage everyone to sign up for our e-blast and on our social media to find out about our next hot topic, our open house and all the new techniques and services we're offering at our practice. I'd like to flip it back to Dr. Rosenberg and Dr. Kerbo, if you'd like to say anything else before we tell everyone goodbye. No, thank you for tuning in. <laughs> well, I, and I, I want to thank everyone too. This is, uh, it's different, but it's fun. And, uh, and we hope this is uh, helpful to everyone and it's helped break up their day uh, because all of our day is sort of similar now. So thank you for, for tuning in with us. So everyone have a great weekend and we'll see you in person soon, hopefully. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.